Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you all here this morning. If you're new here, my name is Shane. I'm the senior pastor. I'm glad that you've joined us this morning as we come together to worship the Lord. If you are new here or visiting this morning, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we'd love if you fill out one of our green Connect cards that are in the chair in front of you. You can pass it uh, to the center uh, during our offering or uh, at the double, right outside these double doors. We have a little Connect Center out there. You could drop it off there as well. Well, many of you saw we had a little trailer out front, and that is because... Uh, the clothing closet is almost here, uh, but there is one problem I want to make you aware of. Uh, they parked the trailer right in my parking spot. Uh, uh, when I find out who gave them permission to put it in that parking spot, I'm probably going to have a couple words with them. Can you believe that? That's where I park during the week. Well, they always say that serving others will cost you something. I just didn't know the cost would be this high. Uh, but what I am thankful for is how many of you are devoting, who are realizing that serving others costs something like time, uh, like, uh, uh, like all the hours that you put into this event. I already want to thank you, even though uh, we're still preparing for the event, uh, for the time you've already put in into this, the volunteers who are collecting clothing, and you could bring that clothing uh, during our normal business hours, which is between uh, 9 and 2, uh, Tuesday through Friday, if you have donations for the clothing closet. Really looking forward to that. We've had really healthy signups, have most of the help we need. If you still want to take part, though, I think there's still a couple slots open. Uh, if you would like to, to help with that, uh, continue to pray for that event, uh, that it would really make an impact in the people's lives who are coming to it, uh, and that we might uh, be able to uh, show the love of Christ, be the light of Christ to our community and all who would walk through our doors. I also want to let you know we had our uh, f first kind of family ministry event uh, last Friday. It was great. We had 50-something people out, which was really good. Uh, parents and grandparents committed to training up their children in the way they should go, and it was a great night, and if you missed it, we'll be having some future uh, nights like that coming up, the next one being in April. So if you missed it the first time but still want to learn about this stuff and how you can engage your children uh, about some of the kind of most controversial things we're dealing with in our society and culture today, um, that we'll be having future events like that. Uh, for now, though, why don't you stand and greet one another with the love of Jesus Christ. service this morning. Heavenly Father, you've been so good and gracious to us. We are amazed at your power and might, your glory, Lord, your creativity, your design for the world around us. And this morning, Lord, uh, we want our hearts and our minds to be aligned to you and your goodness, uh, that our hearts and minds would be an outpouring of praise and thanksgiving to you for who you are and all that you have done. We need your help for that, Lord that we would leave the, behind the things that would, uh, would burden us and instead give those burdens over to you, the one who is able to handle anything that comes our way. I pray that we would glorify you during the service this morning, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me as we worship God through singing. Hymn number 25, Immortal, Invisible, hymn number 20.
228, Rejoice, the Lord is King, hymn number 228. and every day I pray that you help give us the perspective that you are our greatest treasure each and every day strength for today hope for tomorrow we praise you for who you are we rejoice in you we rejoice as well in our giving in this time of offering and we want to be cheerful givers joyful in giving back a portion of what you've given to us we pray these funds will help spread the gospel here in our area and around the world, that Christ will remain known, that people will come to know and have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.
it's a privilege this morning to dedicate some of our children to the Lord. Over, every once in a while, parents come forward as they have their children and want to dedicate and commit uh, themselves and take part in a congregation gathering together in us committing ourselves to bring up our children to know Jesus. So uh, before I invite those families to come forward, I did want to say just a couple things uh, about child dedication that we know what it, it is all about. It is a, first, it's a giving a thanks for our children and thanking God uh, for the children that he has provided us. It's also a, a commi- committing ourselves to bring up our children to know and to trust Jesus, to walk in the ways that they should go so when they grow old they do not depart from it. It's also a dedicating of these children to God, putting them in his hands, knowing that we as parents and, and as a congregation need his help to raise our children, knowing it's ultimately going to be his work uh, that saves them, uh, his work that carries them along where they need to go. And last, it is an inviting of the entire church family into the process of raising the family. Uh, we need one another. Uh, we are God's family here gathered as the church, and we share in that task of encouraging parents, of helping to bring up children and committing them to God. So I want to invite uh, the families uh, forward who are in the service. Uh, And while they do, I want to tell you a couple things that child dedication is not. Uh, First, uh, child dedication is not like baptism. It isn't an analog for that. You guys can come on forward. Come on up. Um, it's not like baptism. It's not a replacement for that. Uh, that's, that's something uh, very different. And it's also not a guarantee of salvation uh, either. Uh, these children, Owen and Reed, will have to make their own choice to trust in Jesus Christ. This is just a commi- you know, committing of the parents and our congregation to raise them, to give them everything they need to know, a foundation for a lifetime of faith. And we know that Jesus wants us to commit ourselves because he wants these little children to come to him. Uh, In Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 16, it says this, and they were bringing the children to him, being Jesus, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them into his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And so now what we're going to do is uh, going to ask you a couple questions. Congregation, I'm going to have you uh, a couple questions. And then, and then kind of figuratively taking these children into our arms, we will bless and pray for them. All right? Oh, before I do, do you guys know Lucas and Cassie Haldeman? It's really funny, their story of, of, of dedicating Reed. Uh, they contacted me last summer about that, and by the end of our conversation, we were talking about both of them getting baptized, and they did last fall. I thought that was so neat. That was really exciting. And uh, Kayla and uh, Alan I- I- Imhoff are dedicating Owen this morning. I'm so glad you're here. All right, so I have a couple questions for you. First, oh, and you may respond, we do, if you do. Uh, do you commit to raising up your children to know Jesus Christ and walk in his ways? Do you dedicate these children to the Lord to lean on God for bringing them up and letting God use them for his will? And congregation, do you commit to encouraging these families, to teaching these children about Jesus Christ and showing them the light of Christ in your words and actions? And we may respond, we do, because we do. Let me pray for you, families, and you guys. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the great gift That is our children. Lord, we understand the great opportunity and responsibility we have as as parents and as a congregation to bring them up and pray that you would empower each of us, Lord, to help encourage these families, to help to teach these children about Jesus so they would have a foundation of faith that would last for a lifetime. Lord, I pray for these parents and thank you for their commitment to you, Lord, and their commitment to teaching Reed and Owen about who Jesus is and what he has done for them. And pray that you would empower them and build them up and encourage them through the ups and downs of parenthood uh, to teach their children what they need to know. And last, Lord, we know ultimately uh, none of us can raise our children without your help, without your empowerment. And I pray that you would work powerfully in these children's lives and that you would bless these children blessing all the way that it would go, protecting them from evil and leading them towards your son. We pray this by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Well, congratulate. You can clap if, out of thankfulness to God. This is for you.
Jennifer Ann, and you can be seated. Well, I invite you to stand as we read from God's Word, Colossians 1, 9-14. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9-14. And so, from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's continue worshiping through singing hymn number 292, God of Grace and God of Glory, hymn number 292. <coughs> And again, uh, before we go into prayer, I've been asked to uh, share a little budget information with you all. Uh, in the back of your bulletin, you'll see uh, some figures that uh, identify our, 
our general fund giving uh, year to date. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with our, our budget, uh, our church budget runs from July 1st to the end of uh, June. So what you're seeing there is giving uh, basically for, for seven months. Now, what uh, these numbers don't reflect is something we'd like to kind of share with you uh, this morning. First of all, our expenditures to date uh, are running approximately $462,000. So we're running pretty close to what, what has been brought in. But another figure that we've been seeing that we'd like to share with you is that on a monthly basis, we've, we've been kind of seeing a pattern where we are not, not meeting what would be our monthly budget uh, income. Uh, however, uh, we've had some timely, unexpected contributions that have helped us kind of bring those, those numbers in line. So again, we wanted to take some time and share some of the information you may not see printed in your bulletin with you. And what I'd like to emphasize is that we are not deficit spending. We'll, we'll leave that to the government. I think I'd also be remiss if, if I didn't acknowledge that we have been blessed uh, many years here with a lot of faithful givers. I think it's been 30 years since we've seen at the end of a budget year where we had a slight negative in our giving versus what our expenditures are. So I want to say thank you for all you uh, who have been contributing over the years. You know, uh, tax season is right around the corner, and I'm sure that you are all eager to, to pay your taxes. But I, uh, I would say this year, as you prepare uh, your taxes, I'd encourage you to, uh, to take some time in prayer and seek God's direction uh, in your giving to the church. Again, thank you for taking, or letting me share with you this morning uh, some of these figures. At this time, uh, let us bow for, for prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, um, before your throne, and thank you for your many blessings. Lord, uh, your budget for, for your grace is, is infinite, and we are so thankful that you haven't set a limit on the grace that you would share with us. Lord, we, we thank you uh, this morning for new life. And Lord, we, we thank you for uh, the children that were dedicated this morning. And we pray for the children as well as the parents as they, as they see, as face the pressures of, of our world today. And Lord, we especially pray for the children that as they grow and mature, that they will one day uh, accept Jesus Christ and be born again. Father, we, uh, we want to say thank you for, again, the many blessings that you've had bestowed upon this church and the, the various ministries. Lord, we thank you for the good turnout for the, the family ministry meeting this past Friday. And Lord, we just pray that you will continue to, to be with the, the different ministries uh, Lord, we pray for the clothing drive coming up this, uh, this weekend. Lord, may it not only meet uh, an, an outreach of material needs for people in this, the surrounding communities, but may it also be a light that they'll see Christ through others. And Lord, we also pray for, the, uh, for our preschool. And again, that outreach and Lord, the... Open house that's coming up, uh, I believe, in about a month. Lord, we again pray that uh, we are reaching others uh, and children uh, for, for, your, for your good. Uh, Father, we have a number of people on our prayer list that uh, we continue to lift up in your name. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray for the many that are dealing with uh, with cancer and treatments. 
Lord, we pray for those who are continuing to deal with uh, back pain and other, other ailments. But Lord, we also thank you for those who are in recovery and pray that you'll continue to give them the strength for the uh, road that's ahead of them in their respective recoveries. Lord, uh, again, we pray for discernment uh, for our own, um, own family budgets. And Lord, we again seek your direction on how we should give. And Father, we uh, just pray now that you'll be with Pastor Shane as he delivers the message. Again, may we listen with our hearts and may we apply it to our day-to-day lives as we go forth today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, sometimes the only way out of a predicament we find ourselves in is for someone else to rescue us, to have mercy on us, to deliver us. Over the last couple of weeks, as we've walked through the book of Judges, I've used a lot of uh, illustrations from the world of driving and getting pulled over. I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to be done with them. We're going to take a break. But I got one more for you, okay? So when I was uh, about 17 years old, I was driving home one night from hanging out with my friends, and I was all fired up. I had had a great evening. I was feeling great, but the thing I wasn't doing was paying attention to how fast I was going. And the reality was I was probably driving way too fast for the road I was on. Uh, There was an additional issue. That road had a speed limit that was kind of marked too low. It was one of those things everyone knew the speed limit was wrong. Uh, You know, everyone knew that it should be probably higher, including the police officer who was sitting there waiting when I flew by him at 170 miles an hour. Or I'm kidding. Relax. I wasn't driving that fast. But I was driving too fast. And I knew it at the time. I looked down and I'm like, oh no, I wasn't even paying attention. I didn't even mean to be speeding at that point. I was just not paying attention to what was going on. He pulled me over and he wrote me a ticket, which was a big problem. But because the road had such a low speed limit and my speed was approaching the speed of sound... The ticket not only was a lot of money, but, and I don't remember exactly, either I would have to like suspend my license or would put points against my license, which would jack up my insurance rates, which I couldn't afford with a part-time job. And it was a serious problem for a 17-year-old. So I had to go to court and kind of uh, find out what was going to happen to me in this ticket. And so I did everything I could that it would go my way. I walked in there and I wore a tie. Can you believe it? A couple of you are shocked, but it was true. I wore a tie to sort of look like I was put together for the judge, uh, I brought my mom along. So when the judge looked out, she would see my mom, please don't write a ticket for my son, right? You know, that's not what my mom said. She said, listen, you're going to get what's coming to you. Like, oh, thanks, mom. <laughs> that's another sermon for another day. Uh, uh, she, was, she was great. I needed to learn a lesson. And last, I even talked to the prosecuting attorney. I was like, listen, I know I messed up. I made a mistake. I was wondering if you might be a little lenient with me. Like, I really... I've learned my lesson. I don't want to lose my license. I don't want to pay too much for insurance. Uh, can you have some mercy on me? He's like, oh, all right, well, well, we'll see. I remember they were standing before the judge after my name got called with just my stomach like that. Do you know that feeling? Not knowing what was going to happen. And at this point, the situation completely out of my control. There was nothing I can do. Either this judge was going to rescue me from a fate worse than death for a 17-year-old or not. And I bring that up this morning because sometimes we find ourselves in that spot where we are out of control of what's about to happen to us, that we can't get ourselves out of a situation, that we can't just pick ourselves up on our own. We need help. Maybe it's some sin we've been struggling with, that we've been ignoring or putting off or saying, oh, I'll deal with it eventually, but it keeps coming back to haunt us again and again and again. At this point, we can't help ourselves. We need some kind of rescue or deliverance. Or maybe we find ourselves stuck in the consequence of some sin in the past that that, that continues to haunt us. And and it's it's not something that we're going to be able to get over on our own, and we need a helper, a deliverer, some kind of rescuer. The good news is that we know a deliverer, that our God in his mercy and graciousness, uh, because of his kindness to us that he has shown us in Jesus Christ, delivers us in so many ways 
when we cannot help ourselves, when we cannot deliver ourselves. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, the God who delivers as we continue in our series In Need of a King, which is walking through the book of Judges. And some of you may be like, finally deliverance, because the book of, or book of Judges is pretty rough. It's, it's had a rough start because the people, the Israelites, uh, were led out of Egypt with great victories by Moses. They were brought into the land, as we read in the book of Joshua, with amazing victories, and they trust in the Lord. But something happens in the book of Judges where they get stuck in this cycle of, uh, of trouble, this cycle of disobedience. And we talked about the cycle in the first week, that uh, it always starts with disobedience. It says they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, then because of that disobedience, there is disaster. Uh, and, and after that disaster, they cry out to God sometimes uh, in this book, uh, and, and God then delivers them from their trouble. Uh, but the problem is they fall back into disobedience again. Well, today we are really going to be focusing on God's deliverance. So you could open up to the book of Judges. We're going to be in, we're going to actually start reading today in chapter 3. We already covered a lot of chapter 2 in the introduction, although I'll be referring back to it often. Uh, so Judges uh, chapter 3, uh, and today we're going to approach it this way. We're going to find out why we need deliverance uh, in the first place, what God can do, and then what we should do. All right, Judges chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon, as far as, far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commands of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, all sorts of ites, apparently, and their sons or, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives. And their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served other gods. And so this is kind of summing up what has happened, already what we've learned in the book, which kind of means we're kind of like turning to a new chapter. We're kind of left the introduction to the story, and we're going to now head into this cycle that the Israelites get stuck in and get our first judge, which is what the book of Judges is named after. And you may be wondering, especially at the end there, uh, as we look at what Israel was doing in turning away from God, uh, and the daughters they took to themselves, and they gave their, you know, the, this intermarriage thing. What's the deal with that? Why was that such a big deal? Well, let me say it wasn't like an, uh, an ethnic thing that they were looking at. It was that they didn't want to intermarry with these other peoples who did not serve God, but instead practiced what would be objectively evil practices by any culture in any history except for these uh, and because if you intermarried into that family, you were more likely to follow their gods, which is exactly what happened, which is why they were warned not to do that, and that is why that is mentioned there. And so if that's the introduction, what happens next? That's what we read in verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. And so we see, if we're looking at that, uh, that cycle again, that they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, disobedience, and then disaster. And it was disastrous for the Israelites. This, this Cushan Rishathaim, you know what that name means? It means king the twice wicked. That was his name. His name was the twice, the twice wicked. Twice wicked. Oh boy, we're in trouble. Uh, I can't even say it. That's how evil and corrupt he was, right? So you could, they were in terrible distress. And you know, I was talking to my community group this week as we were talking about the disobedience and the kind of the, the struggle the Israelites were having with following the Lord. And they were kind of, we were kind of talking like, why was this so hard for them? Why, was it, why were these other gods so compelling after all God had done for him, even if the generation before hadn't kind of done a great job handing down the faith to them? Why turn to these other false gods and idols in the first place? Well, these other false gods promised something. The cultures that worshiped them promised something. 
that these gods, the Baals and the Asheroth, uh, there's a lot of different gods. It wasn't just the two. The Baals is plural. Uh, it, it was a whole bunch of gods, oftentimes regionally. Uh, and each of them promised something to the people. So if you needed your crops to grow, there was a God for that. If you're worried about your crops that year, this God, well, if you served him, and that's the word that keeps getting used here all the time, that like devotion or that serving of this God, then he would make sure that your crops grew okay and promised prosperity. Or if you were concerned about your children, childbirth wasn't as safe uh, uh, back then as it is today, or if you were having trouble uh, getting pregnant, and wanted, there was a God for that. And this God, if you served him, well, the promise was this God was going to help you uh, bear children or have a healthy childbirth or that your child would survive those early years and promised fertility. Or maybe you were worried about your village getting invaded by another. Like, that was what it was like back then. We, it's hard for us to understand that, living in the unbelievable safety that we live in today, comparatively. But that was a concern. And so there, maybe there was a God of war that helped protect you or would give you victory in battle and offer you security. And so what these idols were offering to the people were prosperity, fertility, and security. And you could see how the Israelites, maybe they even married into a family that worshipped these other gods. And yes, I had the Lord God on my side, but boy, I'm really worried about the harvest. Maybe like I'll worship this God a little bit too. Just on the side. Now, I'm still an Israelite, so I'm going to worship the Lord, but I'm still going to worship him. And then you get closer and closer, and suddenly you're worshiping all these false idols, and you are very far from the God who had rescued your people out of Egypt and led you into the land and all those things. Kind of that's how it happens. And that brings us to our first point, uh, that, that the source of our sin is idolatry. That the source of our sin is idolatry. You may be asking, Shane, what's idolatry? Well, it's very clear in the case of the Israelites. Idolatry is worshiping, worshiping something else as God. And so they had uh, all kinds of idols that they would worship. And, but, but for us, it's a little less clear today. Uh, not everyone in our culture is necessarily uh, worshiping a, a false god that they would call a god, but there's still plenty of idolatry. So we need another definition to describe what this is. And idolatry is really devoting yourself fully to or putting your hope in, or putting anything as supreme over God. It's simply devoting ourselves to, or putting our hope in, or putting anything else as supreme, either beside or above God, any of those things as an idol. Because if you put them either, try to have them coexist with God, who is preeminent, like he's not going to share that, but I mean, he's the creator of everything, nothing compares to him. So if you try to put it next to God, or tries to put it above, or you try to put it above God, it's more important to you than God, that's an idol, because that is now serving as the God over your life. And here's the deal, we as humans were created to worship, we're going to worship something, so we either worship the creator God or we're going to be worshiping some kind of idol. We're going to find something else to devote ourselves to and devote ourselves to worship. We were designed with that. When we were designed uh, in, in the beginning of time and God made us to be uh, worshipers of him, uh, but human, humanity rejected his plan for them, that programming of still being a worshiper is still built into us. So we find all sorts of other things to worship, like our money, like things that might provide us a false sense of security. We could worship our family and our family life if we put that above the Lord God. Really, anything can become an idol. And ultimately, you know, we oftentimes look at the outside behaviors of sin in our life, but ultimately the source of all of our sin, whatever it might be, kind of finds its roots in idolatry. Let, 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 me, let me tell you what I mean by that. So uh, let's think about different idols that we find in our cultures today. Let, we already mentioned money. Money can be an idol. If you're always seeking more money, if that is what you're putting your hope in, if that is where you're going to feel your safety in, is that, if that is what you're devoting yourselves to, that number always has to go up, that becomes an idol in your life. 
And that might result in sin. You may not engage with God. You may not trust in God. You may not participate in what God is doing in the lives of others or your own. Because if that is your focus in life, that's the only thing that you're going to be paying attention to. Or let's say we feel fearful about the culture around us. We're afraid of the way it's turning. We're afraid of how our country or our community might be changing all around us. So where do we turn to? Politics. Maybe that will save us. Which, you know, when you think about it like that, it's like, boy, that's, well, you know, it's kind of a, but we do, we do, because it tells us, listen, you, look what this other side is doing. Be afraid. Only we can save you. Uh, and that's the same message every election cycle. It was the same one last time. And it was the same one the time before that. If you don't vote for us, the country will fall apart. And, of course, both sides are saying that, and both of them have been wrong over the last, hundred and whatever years that they've been saying that. I don't know. Maybe since the turn of the century. We'll see. And what happens when we trust in politics, again, you could be, I hope you vote and, and, and you take part in, 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 you know, being a good citizen of the country God has planted us in. But if you think politics is going to save you, then what else ends up happening? Well, you end up disengaging from the work that God is doing. If you think politics is going to save you, you're not going to be loving your neighbor. You're not going to be reaching out into your community. You're not going to be seeking to spread the gospel with others. Because if politics is the solution, then obviously God and the gospel is not the solution. And that's what happens, especially if, if politics is teaching you to hate your neighbor. right? And so it leads to sin. And, and politics becomes this idol that kind of leads to sin and leads us away from God. I think sometimes... And this is a stereotype. It could be men or women, but oftentimes it's men. Their idol is being men who are completely and totally self-sufficient. I live on an island. I don't need any help. I got it. I'm all set. And we almost worship that idea of not needing anybody, of being completely inter- independent from anyone else, of living on our island of solitude. Except... That's not what God has called us to. He's called us to live with people who know us, the good and the bad, and live a life together seeking him first. If we place our value on, like, look how independent I am and strong I am, I can do it. We're not turning to God for our our hope. We're turning to ourselves, right? Idolatry. Many times for uh, women, again, this is a doesn't apply to all, but I've heard it oftentimes enough. It's the expectation of perfection. I've got to have the family in line. I've got to have the grandkids in line. Everything's got to be taken care of at home. And, 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 and the, 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 the temptation is to put, put one's self-worth in that. If, if that goes well, then I'm good, except the problem is your family is made up of other humans that are imperfect. So it's never going to be perfect. And, and that could lead to frustration and yelling and idolatry, if that is what you are putting your value and your hope in, rather than the God who created you, who's going to carry you along, right? All these things can become idols, and it is the source of our sin, because we are trusting in something else other than God, our creator. And that is why we need deliverance, because the scriptures tell us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that while we can live lives or we are following God at one time or another, we're going to slip, we're going to trip, we're going to turn to an idol in a moment of weakness, and we need a deliverer. And so did the Israelites, and that's exactly what happens next. Let me start reading in verse 9. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years, and then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And this is our first judge, Othniel, who comes and saves the day. And Othniel here is very much being portrayed as the ideal judge, because we read further in the book of Judges, we're going to find out that uh, a lot of these guys had a lot of struggles. They are not the ideal judge. They have all sorts of problems, which we are going to visit. But Othniel really is the ideal judge. He has the same kind of courageousness and obedience that we saw in the book of Joshua. 
In fact, uh, one of the ways that Othniel is presented as the uh, ideal judge in the book of Judges is his tie to that previous generation, the generation of Joshua. Uh, Othniel uh, uh, ended up mar- he ended up uh, conquering the city of Debir in Judges chapter one uh, and, and married uh, Caleb's daughter, uh, someone within the household of Israel, something that many Israelites were not doing at. The time, And so there's this strong connection between Othniel and this previous generation that was so courageous uh, and was so obedient. And so he's kind of presented as the ideal judge. But a warning to us, now and in the rest of the book of Judges, our job when we're reading the book of Judges is not to identify the judge, uh, identify with the judge, to be like, now be like Othniel. That's not going to ever be the kind of uh, thrust of the message uh, Othniel here is a, a great example, but what we should be really relating to is, is the people of Israel. And part of that is because uh, they're imperfection, and part of that is because God is the one who sends us our deliverer, right? God is the one who sends us our deliverer. Even in the introduction of Othniel here into the story, who is the one that really saved Israel? Was it because Othniel was so great? No, it says, when they cried up, the Lord raised up a deliverer in verse 9. In verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, Othniel, when he did what he did. And it says uh, that the Lord gave Cushan Rithashayim of Mesopotamia into his hand. It was the Lord who gave Othniel victory. It is God who provides our rescuer, our deliverer. Because God desires to deliver his people from sin. God delivers his people from their sins. God delivered the Israelites from the consequences of their sin, although they had to face, certainly face some consequences during those years with uh, you know, Cushan Rishathayim and his terrible reign over them. But God provided them a deliverer, and God provides us a deliverer as well. That in this story and in all of Judges, it is going to be constantly pointing us to Jesus Christ as the one true deliverer for us. That God knew of our problem with sin. He knew of our problem with idolatry, that we could not do it on our own, that we could not rescue ourselves on our own, that none of us could live perfectly, that there's no way we could somehow earn his love uh, or, or somehow earn our way back into his righteousness. And so God sent us a deliverer. In Jesus Christ. And God delivers us from our sin in two ways. In, in one way, he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and be resurrected from the dead. So that all who believe in him have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. Not because we have earned it or discerned it, but because God desired to deliver us from our sins, from our idolatry and to hold us and keep us to him forever. And the way we get access to our deliverer is simply through faith, simply through trusting in Jesus. And that's the first way. There's a second way that God delivers us from our sins, and it is very much not just a looking into the future thing, not just a big picture, kind of our position with God today, but in our lives, where we live right now. And sometimes we forget that one. That God delivers us not just for eternity with him, but delivers us from our sins today. Now, quick side note. This is where we do side notes over here. Um, I do want to say that God also sometimes delivers us from situations that are not a result of our sin. Uh, Sometimes God chooses to work in amazing ways to deliver us from Uh, maybe sickness or some other situation that has happened to us because we live in a broken world. Uh, That is probably a different sermon from a different day, but I wanted to recognize God's deliverance is so rich. He delivers us from from our sins and from all sorts of troubles and problems that we have uh, in our life. But today, back to, to our kind of main point, we're really talking about how he delivers us from our sins. And he does. That when we look to him and ask for help, he does help lead us out of our trouble and our sin. I mentioned this at the beginning. If there's some sin that has been haunting you, you say, I'm going to take care of it, I'm going to take care of it, I'm going to take care of it, but it never gets taken care of, and it's still there gnawing away at you, 
could turn to God for help. You probably know someone who God has delivered from an addiction, who God has helped move beyond some sin that was plaguing them. God desires to help us today to turn away from our sin and towards him. If you are afraid, and we are all afraid on some days, Parents are afraid for our children. Sometimes we're afraid for our culture and our society. God can deliver us from that fear and to him. Think of Philippians chapter 4, which tells us to bring, our, bring, bring everything to him in prayer. And we will experience a peace that goes beyond all understanding that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He delivers us from our fear that would lead us into sin. If you're feeling lost or desperate today, God delivers people from that lostness, from that restlessness, and the great purpose that comes with following Jesus Christ, to knowing that the works of this life are are not something that uh, just fade away in time, but have eternal significance when we join in God's work of spreading the gospel all around us and encouraging fellow believers in Jesus Christ. God delivers us in so many ways. And as I said before, you could probably think of someone who God has delivered from some trouble, some sin that had plagued them, that had gotten them into a problem, and through turning to God, that person has been delivered from their sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I do want to warn you, that doesn't mean that uh, God will uh, deliver you in exactly the way you ask for uh, every time. Uh, again, no, I, I talked about this last week, that sometimes there are consequences for our sin, and God allows the consequences for those sin to happen in our lives to help teach us and lead us and guide us along the way. If you want uh, to hear more about that, we talked a whole bunch about it and addressed that uh, last week, and you can find that sermon uh, online. And so just a warning, if you're expecting God to deliver me just in this way, understand that he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's going to know uh, ways that are better than our ways. Even the Israelites had to suffer uh, under that king because of their disobedience, but God still delivers. If that's who our God is, if that is what his character is, then we're kind of asked, well, like, well, what do I do? Like, I am feeling like I'm trapped in that spot, Lord. Or, or maybe I'm not, I'm not sinning yet, but like temptation is like crouching at the door, Lord. And, and I know it's there. Or maybe I've been stuck in this cycle in our home, in my family life, in my work life, and it is going wrong over and over again. What do I do? I know what God can do. What do I do? Well, because he is the one that ultimately delivers, the only thing we can do is ask for his help. That we are to cry out to God to deliver us from our distress, trust that he has hurt us, and to walk in his response. To cry out to God to deliver you in your distress, trust that he has heard you, and to walk in his response. And we need to say that. We need to be reminded we can cry out to him for help. Because many times we feel like, well, I've messed up. I can't go to God because, because I've messed up. Like, I'm afraid of what he'll, he'll do or say because I've messed up, and so we kind of hesitate from crying out to him, right? It's like the, I used to know a guy who was, uh, worked in a mechanics place, worked on uh, vehicles all day, and he said the worst jobs he's ever had to do were not the jobs where there was a terrible accident, not when the manufacturer had designed a, a car poorly, but the hardest jobs that he had to do as an auto mechanic is when some guy thought he could fix it on his own and made a bigger mess in the first place. And we, don't, we have to just understand, it's okay that we can't fix it on our own. In fact, turning to Jesus Christ is all about realizing we can't fix it on our own. We have to cry out for God's help, say, God, help me deal with this sin issue. Help me turn from, away from pornography and be freed from it, Lord, so I can live the life you've called me to. Let me turn away from this obsession I have with my money, Lord, that I can't get over, and I'm waking up at nights about it because I'm so worried about it. Help deliver me from that, Lord. Lord, deliver me from my 
fear uh, that would have me watch in the news all day long where I'm just getting angry and angry and I'm just like lashing out at people. I don't know what's wrong with me. Why am I so angry, Lord? Help deliver me from that fear that leads to anger and sin. Lord, help show me that my value is wrapped up in Jesus Christ and him alone, not by my job or my position in my family, not being a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter or managing my household or managing things at work, that you, Lord, are the one who, who I find my value in rather than any of the things of this world to just cry out for help. Because that's what he desires of us. He wants to help us. He wants us to cry out for him. It's why in the book of Judges, even though Israel, the Israelites mess up again and again and again, God delivers them again and again and again, it is his desire to save. It is his desire to deliver. Why would we not cry out to him for help? And when we do cry out, we need to trust that he has heard us. We need to trust that he has heard us. And we also need to walk in his response. And I added that last one because, because it doesn't mean that everything is necessarily going to disappear overnight. Again, there might be consequences for our sin. That's that's part of living life in a broken world. I, I told you about me standing before that judge uh, at the beginning today. Uh, I kind of wanted us to sit in that and didn't want to resolve it too quickly for you. Uh, but uh, the judge, uh, because my mom gave him the eyes and was like, my poor son. No, I'm just kidding. That's not why. Uh, I don't know why he did. But he decided to reduce uh, my ticket. He decided to kind of reduce uh, uh, what the, the speed I was going so the penalty would be under that bar, and my license was not suspended, uh, and I didn't get points against my license. However, I did have to buy, pay a huge fine, which was a problem for a 17-year-old, right? But, he, but I felt like I was delivered from some of my consequences. So I still have to face some consequences for my speeding and driving too fast, but I, I was still delivered from a very large piece of that. And here's what else I was delivered from. I noticed how fast I was going from that point on. I'm not saying I never sped again. That's a different sermon for a different day. But I never made that. I don't, I don't make that mistake. I know how fast I'm going now. Still today. That was like years ago. I don't know. <laughs> a long time ago. I'm paying attention to how fast I'm going now. Like, it worked. Got my attention. And so that is what deliverance is going to be like for us. We may be delivered out of our sin. We may have still had to suffer some of the consequences for that sin. But ultimately, we will be changed for the glory of God. And if we are crying out to him and repenting, turning away from our sin towards him, we're going to be different people because we went through that. We will have learned some important lesson about what it means to trust and follow in follow the Lord, who's going to lead us in the pathway of human thriving rather than distress and trouble. So I want to encourage you, if that day is today that you would cry out to the Lord, or if that day comes someday, to ask him for our help, ask him for his help, because God desires to deliver his people. Not because we are great, not because we've done something to earn that, but because of his mercy, his kindness, and the grace that he has shown us. He has sent us a deliverer to help us in our need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would turn to Jesus Christ and him alone, making him king over our lives, Lord, that we might walk in your ways today and, in, Lord, in the days where, where we slip or we trip or we fall, that we would cry out to help because you have sent us a deliverer. Lord, we are thankful that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and be resurrected from the dead, that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you that, you that he sent us the Holy Spirit to live in us, that he would speak into our lives and show us the way in which we should go, that he is the agent of the supernatural life change that can take place when we trust in Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, that we would learn to be a people that are constantly clinging to you, 
and are ready to cry out for help when we need it. Trusting in your goodness and your graciousness to lead us in the way we should go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we close with singing hymn number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Hymn number 201. Have courage, hold on to what is good, honor all men. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great week of worship.